Hello friends, my name is JJ. So the other day I was reading this fascinating website called Legends of Localization, which documents the various changes that happen to video games when they're imported to America from Japan. In many ways, it is really less a website about video games per se than documenting the complexity of transferring a cultural product from one country to another. Anyway, an essay on the site that particularly captivated me was this one about the many different versions of the word I and me that exist in Japan. You see, the Japanese apparently have over a dozen different versions of these two words, with each version carrying a slightly different cultural meaning. And as a result, in Japanese pop culture, the version of I and me that a character uses will often serve as a convenient short hand to communicate all sorts of important things about their personality to the audience. So for example, Sonic uses a version of I and me that is stereotypically considered masculine and crude, while Princess Peach uses the version that is considered more upright and elegant, and in the Gorons from Zelda, use the version that is considered more rural or hickish. Anyway, it got me thinking about what, if anything, is the closest analogy to this in American popular culture. Do we have any similar linguistic shorthands that our writers and directors use to quickly convey the fundamental personality of a character? Of course we do. They're called accents. In a strict dictionary sense, accents are simply regional variations in how people pronounce different words, which contributes to audibly different rhythms of speaking. In day-to-day -day life, American accents are mostly just a way of identifying what part of America different people come from. In American popular culture, however, accents tend to function in a much more stylized, and abstract way and can be a critical part of character building. Much like Japanese pronoun use, making a character from a movie or a TV show or a video game speak with a particular American accent will often wind up conveying a big part of their personality, even if it will mostly come from simplistic or unfair cultural stereotypes. So today I thought we would do a quick survey of what I believe to be the 10 main accents of American popular culture. We will look at what their origins are and how they function in American pop culture today, complete with lots of examples from modern American media. I do have to apologize though, because as longtime viewers will know, I do not personally have a very deep or sophisticated pop culture diet. I'm actually hoping that as I start citing examples of various characters who speak with these different accents, you guys will be able to come up with some good examples of your own and write them in the comments. That way we can attempt to create a more comprehensive list together. The more obscure, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Also, keep in mind that the best examples are when the accent of a character is not specifically tied to where they currently live. Like obviously if a show took place in Boston, you would expect everyone to have Boston accents and as a result the accents wouldn't tell you much about any individual character's personality. But say if the show took place in some generic middle American setting, or especially an imaginary fantasy setting, then the decision to give a character a Boston accent would suddenly be much more significant and revealing. Okay, ready? Let's go. So accent number one is the most generic, and I suspect would be the accent that most Americans watching this video right now would believe themselves to have, which is the so-called general American accent. Now, it can always be a bit controversial in a diverse society to describe any one cultural trait as being normal, but at the same time, I think it would be relatively uncontentious to suggest that the vast majority of Americans think of the general American accent, the accent most associated with Hollywood movie stars and newscasters as being default or plain. It's for this reason that general American accents are almost always given to main characters. Since we are supposed to identify with the hero of a story, it makes sense that their accent would steer towards the universal and generic, regardless of where their story takes place. Yeah, um, and uh, with pickles, and can you smoosh it down real flat? Thanks. Good thing you brought those senzu beans after all, huh, Yajirobe? We all make mistakes. It's what makes us human. The second and perhaps most famous American accent of all would be the Southern accent, which is to say any one of the stereotypically drawling Southern accents associated with people living south of the Mason-Dixon line. Now, I would say that there are maybe three broad ways that the Southern accent is used in American popular culture. The first is one that evokes a stereotype of the American South as a very poor and rural place where people are generally less educated and society is less modern 
Southern. So giving a character a strong Southern accent would signify that they're kind of a dumb, hickish sort of person. For example, the villain Fuzzy Lumpkins on the Powerpuff Girls. No, I'm a sorry, Joe. I can't play your party tonight. I got them darn power puffs in my noodle. Or clumsy Smurf on the Smurfs. Smurf it real hard, clumsy, and watch my thumb. Uh, okay, Brainy. Here goes. Yeah! Gosh, I'm sorry, Brainy. I was watching the other thumb. And of course, Cletus the slack jawed yokel on. The Simpsons. A C minus, huh? Well, let's celebrate. Hi, Brian Dean! Empty out the tub, we's making rum. The second take is what we could call the Southern Belle or Southern Gentleman use of the accent, in which the goal is to convey a character who is very superficially polite and charming and probably quite flirtatious as well. This evokes the idea of the American South as a place with a fairly aristocratic upper class, though often with a bit of a dark edge as well. Probably the most iconic cartoon example of this would be the old Warner Brothers character, Foghorn Leg horn who is played as being very charismatic and extroverted. Now let's hear your side of the story, sister. Well... I know just, I say I know just what you're gonna say. You're looking for a husband. Yes. Well, you're going about it all wrong, girlie. You don't bat him on the bean with a rolling pin. That comes later. A good female example, meanwhile, would be the very slick and decadent Blanche on Golden Girls. I have this recurring fantasy. Take me, Alex, take me now, I tell him. <laughs> and he says to me, oh, 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 Blanche, in the form of a question. Rogue on X-Men would probably be a good female example too. You look a little on the weary side, honey. Been a long shift. And lastly, the third most common use of the Southern accent, I would say, tends to come in the form of a character who is sort of brash and reckless, maybe even a little bloodthirsty. I feel like you tend to see this a lot in military type scenarios where the most aggressive or impatient officer will often have a Southern accent of some sort, like the bad guy in Avatar. The Avatar program is a bad joke. Bunch of limp dick science majors. However, it does present an opportunity, both timely and unique. This also describes the way that King DDD is portrayed in the Kirby cartoon. It's a nuts job to do what I say, and I say get rid of Kirby! And for an even deeper pull, I would cite this one bad guy from Star Fox 64, a train driver who is rather rash and irritable. Here come the little hyenas now. These cats for real be I always thought that was a good directorial choice in a game not exactly known for its stellar voice acting. This particular stereotype is probably rooted in a certain idea of Southerners as cowboys and thus a kind of wild, untamed people who don't like to be told what to do. I guess Sandy from SpongeBob would be a good example of this too, now that I think of it. Why you low down, no good, bottom dwelling, dang come it, come back here! You wanna see what I'm gonna do to you? All right, moving on, a third example is what I wanna call the ESL accent, which is the accent of anyone for whom English is clearly their second language and thus something they struggle with. Now, I don't wanna to get too much into specific foreign accents because obviously in many cases, a foreign accent would be used mainly to signify that a character was from some specific foreign country with his characterization in turn being bound up in pop culture stereotypes about what that country is like. A character with a strong French accent would be a snob, yada yada. But I think it is also possible to think about how characters who struggle with English more generally are portrayed in American pop culture, especially if they're not explicitly framed as coming from any real world place. In those kind of cases, the ESL accent is often used just as evidence that the character is sort of dopey and simple-minded, with his inability to express himself clearly in English being used as a proxy for the idea that he just isn't very intelligent in general. He is clearly a tender, loving thing. How can you have the heebie-jeebies for Mr. Alex? Look at him. He's so cute. I will perform any operation for $129.95. Nisa caused maybe one or two wee little bitty accidentes. If it will save your job, I will pretend to be your boyfriend. <laughs> we should probably practice. 
This is of course a fairly mean-spirited and unfair stereotype, which is why it mostly seems to be on its way out these days. And speaking of minorities, let us now talk about the African American accent. Now, people debate whether the distinctive speech patterns of many black Americans are best described as an accent, dialect, tone, or something else. But whatever we call it, it is an observable phenomenon and one that has often provided a lot of fodder for American cultural commentary on race relations. Well, you might hear a white comedian impersonate a black guy. Now, how's he gonna sound? Say, my man, what's happening? <laughs> Now, I do not get mad, Conan. Right, right. I can see how to a white guy, a black guy might actually sound like that. Sing song it. Right. Musical. Show me what you're working with. White people have a gift where you could say terrible things and it don't sound terrible with that speech pattern. Really? I hear it all the time. Job interviews. I'm sorry, Mr. Poe, we're just not hiring anyone else. But we'll keep you in mind if something opens up. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> in the recent film, Sorry to Bother You, the differences between white and black accents is a major plot point and is played up to an absurd degree. Nobody get hurt, man. I'm just trying to give you some game. You want to make some money here? Then read the script with a white voice. When people say I talk with a white voice anyway, so why ain't it helping me out? I'm not talking about Will Smith's wife. I'm talking about the real deal. Like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer. This is Langston from Regal View. I didn't catch you at the wrong time, did I? Now, when it comes to non-human or fantasy characters, giving someone an identifiably black voice seems to be traditionally done as a way of signaling that they are cool in some sort of stereotypically black way, as seen here with the unsubtly named Jazz in Transformers. This looks like a cool place to kick it. I used to watch the online cartoon Homestar Runner a lot, and the slick concession stand owner Bubs has a very cliched black accent. No, no, no. Getting me to say my name backwards minus the B just makes me lose my superpower. What superpower? Being able to fly? You can fly? Well, not anymore, I can't. In Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, meanwhile, the sole black-voiced character is Wilt, who is this hip basketball playing guy. Just a little joke? Well, I'm not laughing. Must have gone over your head. Over my head? What, is that another one of your so-called jokes? Or how about the preacher bot in Futurama who speaks in the style of a theatrical black minister? Robosexuality is an abomination. The good book saith a robot shall not lie down with a human. Given our sensitivities are in race, there is obviously a lot of controversy inherent in how black voices are used in the media. It can seem patronizing when black actors are only used to voice characters with stereotypically black characteristics and offensive when a white voice actor mimics a black accent for the same reason. The Simpsons recently stopped their practice of using white actors to voice black characters, and my guess would be that in fantasy cartoons especially, there's probably going to be a lot of increased focus on just using black actors interchangeably with white ones with less leaning on their voices as a source of characterization. All right, now let us talk about the so-called Fargo accent, which is basically the accent of people who live in the northern part of the Midwestern United States, particularly Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. This is a region of the US that is routinely stereotyped as being very average, unambitious, and friendly. As a result, American pop culture tends to like using their accent as a shorthand for characters who share these qualities. I want you to tell me what these fellas look like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. In what way? I don't know, just funny looking. Can you be any more specific? I couldn't really say. He wasn't circumcised. This is a particularly popular accent to give to a certain sort of simple-minded middle-class woman whose friendliness masks a kind of sheltered ignorance. Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. All you did was push it to one side of the room, don't you know? You know, it looks like the gee golly wreck of the Hesperus. As Stuart's mother, I need to protect him from the media's glamorous portrayals of violence. There. That's better. Why don't you watch baseball? When Tina Fey famously portrayed Sarah Palin on Saturday Night Live, she basically gave her this accent. You know, I met Barack Obama. Well, if he's angry, I certainly can't tell. 
His words are smooth. When he's talking, it's like an angel whispering in your ear. <laughs> he makes John McCain sound like a garbage truck unloading trash at a landfill. Which, although similar to the rural accent that Sarah Palin actually has, became much more exaggerated and precise in order to make Palin more consistent with this existing American cultural cliché. Another very female-centric accent would be that of the Jewish New York woman. This is a kind of nasally accent that tends to play on certain stereotypes of Jewish women as being very naggy or whiny, particularly Jewish mothers. Young man, you are not to watch that show anymore! It's immature toilet humor! But these days it is often used for non-Jewish characters as well. Why is it every time I open this door you seem to be in some ridiculous vehicle you've inexplicably acquired? And the dime, call me, and monkey chow. Monkey chow? For what? Well, for the monkeys, of course! Don't you tell me not to have a crap attack! I'll have a crap attack anytime I want! Now go to your room! The most famous example of all, however, would be Fran Drescher in the 90s era sitcom The Nanny. She has this kind of accent naturally, and she really embraced it as one of her character's defining traits. But I must say, Jerry Schwartz and I spent the better part of the Blue Lagoon tongue wrestling. <laughs> you mean thumb wrestling? Oh yes, of course, honey, that's exactly what I meant. The popularity of the nanny almost certainly played a big role in making this sort of accent a cliché of sitcom moms in general. I remember there was even an explicit joke about this in Family Guy once, where they recast Lois with Fran. Oh, Peter, you promised me you wouldn't drink at the stag party. <laughs> Ugh, I do not sound like that. There is also a New York Jewish man accent that you occasionally hear, sometimes called the Yiddish accent, which is associated with urban Jewish immigrant culture in the early years of the last century. In Animaniacs, the bad guy Walter Wolf has this sort of accent. Knock it off with the shelf, pity! We are cartoon villains, so we never get the awards! <laughs> Stupid dentures. As does Paw Grape in Veggie Tales. Well, you know, he just turned 18 years old. Yeah, so? So that would make him a casserole head, pimento loaf iguana man! And that one old guy on The Simpsons. Oi, 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 where did you get this, you shrunken old hag, you? I'm just a little girl. I feel like this accent evokes a certain cliche of a certain sort of out of touch grandpa from an immigrant family who hasn't yet fully assimilated to American culture, and probably never will, and has a bit of a chip on his shoulder as a result. But as this kind of person becomes a less familiar figure in American life, I feel like the fictional portrayal is sort of on its way out too. All right, now the next one is an accent that I have always personally enjoyed. It is an exaggerated version of a kind of upper-class aristocratic accent, originally associated with places like New Hampshire, Connecticut, or Vermont, sometimes called the preppy accent. I don't know if there's actually that many people who speak this way these days, but in pop culture, it is often used to characterize someone who is an extremely old money, waspy, blue blood type. The rich guy in Gilligan's Island is the classic example. Well, you haven't got the knack of being idly rich. You see, you should do like me, just snooze and dream. Dream and snooze, the pleasures are unlimited. Another great use is the judge in Futurama, whose accent plays into his portrayal as a snob, hopelessly indifferent to the needs of ordinary people. The charge is bank robbery. Now, my caddy chauffeur informs me that a bank is a place where people put money that isn't properly invested. Therefore, robbing a bank is tantamount to that most heinous of crimes, theft of money. In the 90s era computer game Day of the Tentacle, which is based around time travel, George Washington is given this accent as well. No, no. I was just admiring my reflection in the window. Striking, aren't I? There is also a female version of this accent, associated with an equally arrogant and often highly theatrical upper-class woman. On Frasier, Dr. Crane's agent BB, I believe, is supposed to have an accent of this sort. Darling. It's San Francisco. Do you know what life is like there for a good-looking straight man? 
It would be like a Snickers bar at a fat camp. Originating from the opposite end of the country, we have the surfer accent, which supposedly comes from the beaches of California, though again, I am not sure if many Californians actually speak this way these days. But it has long been a very popular voice for characters intended to be super laid back and dopey and possibly a little stoned as well. And if they were here now and not dead, they'd all want us to be one big party instead of two parties fighting about whose party has the better music and munchies. You, mini man, taking on the jellies. You got serious thrill issues, dude. The only true wisdom consists in knowing that you know nothing. That's us, dude. Oh yeah. The female version would be the so-called Valley Girl accent, which, as the name suggests, supposedly originates from the San Fernando Valley region of California. And it is similarly popular for characters who are supposed to be sort of airheaded and preoccupied with stuff like the latest slang and fashion at the expense of much else. Ew, like this requires telekinetic communication, Buster. I'll have to like meld with the meal. You two goobers have the special honor of taking me to Keel Hall's chicest boutique. This girl's got a mega craving for some tasty new outfits. For number nine, we are going to go with what I think is usually described as either a somewhat generic New Yorker accent or East Coast Italian American accent. I think people actually from that part of the US would call this a Bronx or Jersey accent specifically. But in American pop culture, I feel it's kind of evolved into its own thing. It is now often used on characters who are kind of cocky and scheming, like the villain Psycho on the Earthworm Jim cartoon. Hello, I'm Psycho. Go to the spaceways. I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about a very serious problem. The illness known as superheroism. Or the coach on Big Mouth. Look alive, you little maniacs. I bet you're all like completely distracted by the big dance, which I happen to be chaperoning. You know, not a big deal. I mean, I could have asked anyone, but you know, I volunteered. Because of New York's association with American gangster culture, you also tend to see this accent used a lot for thuggish or criminal characters of all sorts. Call this a table? I wouldn't hit a guy over the head with this table. You hear that? The Donbot don't like it. I ought to clamp you. You want to be clamped? Yes, you gangsters, I'm better than this. What was I thinking? That I'll use serious wipes. <laughs> I often feel like this must be a pretty tough accent for people to have in real life, just because most of the media stereotypes associated with it are so unflattering. But American pop culture is certainly an equal geographic offender in this sense, with crude stereotypes of both North and South being equally entrenched. In fact, this Texas comedy band that I am quite fond of called the Austin Lounge Lizards have this one great song called The War Between the States that is basically all about the pathetic nature of the southern side of the Civil War. But then it also contains this funny part where they describe how the surrender went down. Well, the Yankees had our number. They called us on the phone and they said, Hey, you guys have lost the war. Why is it going back home? All right, now this last one might be a bit of a twist, but it's the British accent. Obviously, this is not an accent that is native to the US, but it does appear a lot in American popular culture and almost always to establish a character as being very intelligent and sophisticated. Might I ask where you are taking our good friend Coco? To get some clothes. Clothes? Staying in the game, I run the risk of losing my entire stake and being humiliated in front of all these lovely people. Humiliated is such a strong word. You do play rough though, don't you? Why are you avoiding me? Well, I do have a business to run, detective. I can't play good cop, handsome devil cop all the time. So here's one very good example that I think really illustrates the nuances of American accent culture. It is from the show Fairly Odd Parents. For those who haven't seen it, two of the main characters are Wanda, who is smart, and Cosmo, who is dumb. And in one episode, we meet their opposite world versions, and the dumb version of Wanda has a southern accent. <laughs> I'm incredibly stupid and eat with my feet. While the hyper intelligent version of Cosmo is. I'm the anti fairy Cosmo. I'm not an idiot in any manner whatsoever. A related spin off would be the trope of a villain with a British accent, which seems particularly common in kids' entertainment. My 
idea of a perfect school is one in which there are no children at all. Well, I was first in line until the little hairball was born. That hairball is my son and your future king. Oh, I shall practice my curtsy. Now that I command hexadecimal's power, none can stand against me. You did that? To your own sister? Yes, yes, yes. It's rather good, isn't it? I guess the common theme running through all of these characters would be intimidation. The idea that British voices are on some level kind of intimidating to Americans, and thus a character who speaks in an overtly British way would be understood by audiences to exist on some higher level than the American voiced characters, be it a higher plane of classiness, smarts, or villainy. People have speculated a lot as to why this is. Obviously one common explanation is that it has something to do with America's colonial past, and that even more than 200 years after independence, Americans still subconsciously revere Brits on some level. This is something I know that Brits themselves like to make fun of Americans for. The idea that even a person who is an obvious buffoon or charlatan in England will nevertheless be able to easily win over Americans through the sheer intimidating power of his accent alone. Americans are likewise supposedly unable to distinguish the significant class and regional differences in British accents, which can make the intimidation factor seem even more preposterous. I remember there was an explicit joke about this on Fraser once, where Daphne's lower class English brother was able to seduce Rob an otherwise savvy American woman who nevertheless could not grasp how low class his accent was. No, good thing too is it was an especially good time for me to get out of England. God, he talks just like a prince. But I think an equally plausible theory is just that British immigrants to the US tend to be disproportionately likely to hold very elite jobs, like magazine editor or talk show host or Pierce Brosnan. In other words, Americans might assume that people with British accents are elite for the perfectly rational reason that a lot of Brits living in America are. Smith, are you falling asleep? Oh, sorry, sir, just a little tired. Oh, not to worry, I've got some cocaine right here. Now something I've always been interested in is how characters with American accents are portrayed in British shows. I'm not too familiar with British pop culture, so I don't have a lot of examples, but I do know that in the popular British cartoon Danger Mouse, the character of Count Duckula is given a generic American accent, and this is used as a way of portraying him as being very vain and fame obsessed. In Abu Dhabi, they're making an island in the shape of my head. Oh, okay, my producer, who is me, is telling me that we're out of time. And by we, I mean you. So, adios, big mouth. I would be curious to hear from my British viewers if this is a common use of the American accent in British pop culture, and if you have any other good examples from the British media. All right, so those are my picks for the 10 most iconic accents of American pop culture. I'm curious to hear if you think there are any major accents that I forgot, and like I said, I am also eager to hear your examples of characters who fit into these categories that I described. I feel like one of the defining traits of culture building in the modern age is the process of stylization, which is to say the evolutionary cycle in which a phenomenon inevitably gets more abstract over time, becoming symbolic or cliched in sync with the original context being forgotten. I guess this is actually pretty similar to Baudrillard's theory of the simulacra, as I discussed in that other video. But anyway, Anyway, I think that the role of accents in American pop culture is a very strong example of this, just because they seem to be thriving as storytelling devices even at a time when actual strong accents are becoming less common in American life. Ironically enough, in part because of the homogenizing effect of American mass media. A hundred years from now, it strikes me as being completely plausible that you could still have characters on TV or whatever speaking like Southern Hicks or New England Blue Bloods, just because audible signifiers of this sort are so helpful from a character building perspective. They're basically the vocal equivalent of prisoners wearing stripes or a round bomb with a fuse. Some cliches are just too useful to give up. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.